the oriental tale of the cobbler astrologer told by charles john tibbets this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana in october 2018 the cobbler astrologer in the great city of Isfahan lived Ahmed the cobbler, an honest and industrious man, whose wish was to pass through life quietly, and he might have done so had he not married a handsome wife, who, although she had condescended to accept of him as a husband, was far from being contented with his humble sphere of life. Sitara, such was the name of ahmed's wife was ever forming foolish schemes of riches and grandeur and though ahmed never encouraged them he was too fond a husband to quarrel with what gave her pleasure an incredulous smile or a shake of the head was his only answer to her often told daydreams and she continued to persuade herself that she was certainly destined to great fortune it happened one evening while in this temper of mind that she went to the hemam where she saw a lady retiring dressed in a magnificent robe covered with jewels and surrounded by slaves this was the very condition sitara had always longed for and she eagerly inquired the name of the happy person who had so many attendants and such fine jewels she learned it was the wife of the chief astrologer to the king with this information she returned home her husband met her at the door but was received with a frown nor could all his caresses obtain a smile or a word for several hours she continued silent and in apparent misery at length she said cease your caresses unless you are ready to give me a proof that you do really and sincerely love me what proof of love exclaimed poor ahmed can you desire which i will not give give over cobbling it is a vile low trade and never yields more than ten or twelve dinars a day turn astrologer your fortune will be made and i shall have all i wish and be happy astrologer cried ahmed astrologer have you forgotten who i am a cobbler without any learning that you want me to engage in a profession which requires so much skill and knowledge i neither think nor care about your qualifications said the enraged wife all i know is that if you do not turn astrologer immediately i will be divorced from you to-morrow the cobbler remonstrated but in vain the figure of the astrologer's wife with her jewels and her slaves had taken complete possession of sitara's imagination all night it haunted her she dreamt of nothing else and on awaking she declared she would leave the house if her husband did not comply with her wishes what could poor ahmed do he was no astrologer but he was dotingly fond of his wife and he could not bear the idea of losing her he promised to obey and having sold his little stock bought an astrolabe an astronomical almanac furnished with these he went to the market-place crying i am an astrologer i know the sun and the moon and the stars and the twelve signs of the zodiac i can calculate nativities i can foretell everything that is to happen no man was better known than ahmed the cobbler a crowd soon gathered round him what friend ahmed said one have you worked till your head is turned are you tired of looking down at your last cried another that you are now looking up at the planets these and a thousand other jokes assailed the ears of the poor cobbler who notwithstanding continued to exclaim that he was an astrologer having resolved on doing what he could to please his beautiful wife it so happened that the king's jeweller was passing by he was in great distress having lost the richest ruby belonging to the crown every search had been made to recover the inestimable jewel but to no purpose and as the jeweller knew he could no longer conceal its loss from the king he looked forward to death as inevitable in this hopeless state while wandering about the town he reached the crowd around ahmed and asked what was the matter <laughs> don't you know ahmed the cobbler said one of the bystanders laughing he has been inspired and has become an astrologer 
Well, a drowning man will catch at a broken reed. The jeweler no sooner heard the sound of the word astrologer than he went up to Ahmed, told him what had happened, and said, If you understand your art, you must be able to discover the king's ruby. Do so, and I will give you two hundred pieces of gold. But if you do not succeed within six hours, I will use all my influence at court to have you put to death as an impostor. Poor Ahmed was thunderstruck. He stood long without being able to move or speak, reflecting on his misfortunes, and grieving, above all, that his wife, whom he so loved, had by her envy and selfishness brought him to such a fearful alternative. Full of these sad thoughts, he exclaimed aloud, O oh, woman, woman, thou art more baneful to the happiness of man than the poisonous dragon of the desert. Well, the lost ruby had been secreted by the jeweler's wife, who, disquieted by those alarms which ever attend guilt, sent one of her female slaves to watch her husband. This slave, on seeing her master speak to the astrologer, drew near, and when she heard Ahmed, after some moments of apparent abstraction, compare a woman to a poisonous dragon, she was satisfied that he must know everything. She ran to her mistress, and, breathless with fear, cried, "'You are discovered, my dear mistress. You are discovered by a vile astrologer. Before six hours are past, the whole story will be known, and you will become infamous if you are even so fortunate as to escape with life, unless you can find some way of prevailing on him to be merciful.' She then related what she had seen and heard, and Ahmed's exclamation carried as complete conviction to the mind of the terrified mistress as it had done to that of her slave. The jeweler's wife, hastily throwing on her veil, went in search of the dreaded astrologer. When she found him, she threw herself at his feet, crying, "'Spare my honor and my life, and I will confess everything.' "'What can you have to confess to me?' exclaimed Ahmed in amazement. Oh, nothing, nothing with which you are not already acquainted. You know too well that I stole the ruby from the king's crown. I did so to punish my husband, who uses me most cruelly, and I thought by this means to obtain riches for myself and to have him put to death. But you, most wonderful man, from whom nothing is hidden, have discovered and defeated my wicked plan. I beg only for mercy, and will do whatever you command me. An angel from heaven could not have brought more consolation to Ahmed than did the jeweler's wife. He assumed all the dignified solemnity that became his new character, and said, Woman, I know all thou hast done, and it is fortunate for thee that thou hast come to confess thy sin and beg for mercy before it was too late. Return to thy house, Put the ruby under the pillow of the couch on which thy husband sleeps. Let it be laid on the side furthest from the door. And be satisfied, thy guilt shall never be even suspected. The jeweler's wife returned home and did as she was desired. In an hour Ahmed followed her and told the jeweler he had made his calculation, and found by the aspect of the sun and the moon, and by the configuration of the stars, that the ruby was at that moment lying under the pillow of his couch on the side furthest from the door. The jeweler thought Ahmed must be crazy, but as a ray of hope is like a ray from heaven to the wretched, he ran to the couch, and there, to his joy and wonder, found the ruby in the very place described. He came back to Ahmed, embraced him, called him his dearest friend and the preserver of his life, and gave him the two hundred pieces of gold, declaring that he was the first astrologer of the age. These praises conveyed no joy to the poor cobbler, who returned home, more thankful to God for his preservation than elated by his good fortune. The moment he entered the door, his wife ran up to him and exclaimed, "'Well, my dear astrologer, what success?' There, said Ahmed very gravely, there are two hundred pieces of gold. I hope you will be satisfied now, and not ask me again to hazard my life as I have done this morning. He then related all that had passed, but the recital made a very different impression on the lady from what these occurrences had made on Ahmed. Sitara saw nothing but the gold, which would enable her to vie with the chief astrologer's wife at Himam. Courage, she said. 
courage my dearest husband this is only your first labour in your new and noble profession go on and prosper and we shall become rich and happy in vain ahmed remonstrated and represented the danger she burst into tears and accused him of not loving her ending with her usual threat of insisting upon a divorce ahmed's heart melted and he agreed to make another trial accordingly next morning he sallied forth with his astrolabe his twelve signs of the zodiac and his almanac exclaiming as before i am an astrologer i know the sun and the moon and the stars and the twelve signs of the zodiac i can calculate nativities i can foretell everything that is to happen a crowd again gathered round him but it was now with wonder and not ridicule for the story of the ruby had gone abroad and the voice of fame had converted the poor cobbler ahmed into the ablest and most learned astrologer that was ever seen at isfahan while everybody was gazing at him a lady passed by veiled she was the wife of one of the richest merchants in the city and had just been at the hammam where she had lost a valuable necklace and earrings she was now returning home in great alarm lest her husband should suspect her of giving her jewels to a lover seeing the crowd around ahmed she asked the reason of their assembling and was informed of the whole story of the famous astrologer how he had been a cobbler was inspired with supernatural knowledge and could with the help of his astrolabe his twelve signs of the zodiac and his almanac discover all that ever did or ever would happen in the world the story of the jeweller and the king's ruby was then told to her accompanied by a thousand wonderful circumstances which had never occurred the lady quite satisfied of his skill went up to ahmed and mentioned her loss saying a man of your knowledge and penetration will easily discover my jewels find them and i will give you fifty pieces of gold the poor cobbler was quite confounded and looked down thinking only how to escape without a public exposure of his ignorance the lady in pressing through the crowd had torn the lower part of her veil ahmed's downcast eyes noticed this and wishing to inform her of it in a delicate manner before it was observed by others he whispered to her lady look down at the rent the lady's head was full of her loss and she was at that moment endeavouring to recollect how it could have occurred ahmed's speech brought it at once to her mind and she exclaimed in delighted surprise stay here a few moments thou great astrologer i will return immediately with the reward thou so well deservest saying this she left him and soon returned carrying in one hand the necklace and earrings and in the other a purse with the fifty pieces of gold there is gold for thee she said thou wonderful man to whom all the secrets of nature are revealed i had quite forgotten where i laid the jewels and without thee should never have found them but when thou desirest me to look at the rent below i instantly recollected the rent near the bottom of the wall in the bathroom where before undressing i had hid them i can now go home in peace and comfort and it is all owing to thee thou wisest of men after these words she walked away and ahmed returned to his home thankful to providence for his preservation and fully resolved never again to tempt it his handsome wife however could not yet rival the chief astrologer's lady in her appearance at the hammam so she renewed her entreaties and threats to make her fond husband continue his career as an astrologer about this time it happened that the king's treasury was robbed of forty chests of gold and jewels forming the greater part of the wealth of his kingdom the high treasurer and other officers of state used all diligence to find the thieves but in vain the king sent for his astrologer and declared that if the robbers were not detected by a stated time he as well as the principal ministers should be put to death only one day of the short period given them remained all their search had proved fruitless and the chief astrologer who had made his calculations and exhausted his art to no purpose had quite resigned himself to his fate when one of his friends advised him to send for the wonderful cobbler who had become so famous for his extraordinary discoveries two slaves were immediately dispatched for ahmed whom they commanded to go with them to their master 
you see the effects of your ambition said the poor cobbler to his wife i am going to my death the king's astrologer has heard of my presumption and is determined to have me executed as an impostor on entering the palace of the chief astrologer he was surprised to see that dignified person come forward to receive him and lead him to the seat of honor and not less so to hear himself thus addressed the ways of heaven most learned and excellent ahmed are unsearchable the high are often cast down and the low are lifted up the whole world depends upon fate and fortune it is my turn now to be depressed by fate it is thine to be exalted by fortune his speech was here interrupted by a messenger from the king who having heard of the cobbler's fame desired his attendance poor ahmed now concluded that it was all over with him and followed the king's messenger praying to god that he would deliver him from his peril when he came into the king's presence he bent his body to the ground and wished his majesty long life and prosperity tell me ahmed said the king who has stolen my treasure hmm it was not one man answered ahmed after some considerations there were forty thieves concerned in the robbery very well said the king but who were they and what have they done with my gold and my jewels these questions said ahmed i cannot answer now but i hope to satisfy your majesty if you will grant me forty days to make my calculations i grant you forty days said the king but when they are past if my treasure is not found your life shall pay the forfeit ahmed returned to his house well pleased for he resolved to take advantage of the time allowed him to fly from a city where his fame was likely to be his ruin well ahmed said his wife as he entered what news at court no news at all said he except that i am to be put to death at the end of forty days unless i find forty chests of gold and jewels which have been stolen from the royal treasury but you will discover the thieves how by what means am i to find them by the same art which discovered the ruby and the lady's necklace the same art replied ahmed foolish woman thou knowest that i have no art and that i have only pretended to it for the sake of pleasing thee but i have had sufficient skill to gain forty days during which time we may easily escape to some other city and with the money i now possess and the aid of my former occupation we may still obtain an honest livelihood <gasps> an honest livelihood repeated his lady with scorn will thy cobbling thou mean spiritless wretch ever enable me ever to go to the hammam like the wife of the chief astrologer hear me ahmed think only of discovering the king's treasure thou hast just as good a chance of doing so as thou hadst of finding the ruby and the necklace and the earrings at all events i am determined thou shalt not escape and shouldst thou attempt to run away i will inform the king's officers and have thee taken up and put to death even before the forty days are expired thou knowest me too well ahmed to doubt my keeping my word so take courage and endeavour to make thy fortune and to place me in that rank of life to which my beauty entitles me oh the poor cobbler was dismayed at this speech but knowing that there was no hope of changing his wife's resolution he resigned himself to his fate well said he your will shall be obeyed all i desire is to pass the few remaining days of my life as comfortably as i can you know i am no scholar and have little skill in reckoning so there are forty dates give me one of them every night after i have said my prayers that i may put them in a jar and by counting them may always see how many of the few days i have to live are gone the lady pleased at carrying her point took the forty dates and promised to be punctual in doing what her husband desired meanwhile the thieves who had stolen the king's treasure having been kept from leaving the city by fear of detection and pursuit had received accurate information of every measure taken to discover them 
one of them was among the crowd before the palace on the day the king sent for ahmed and hearing that the cobbler had immediately declared their exact number he ran in a fright to his comrades and exclaimed we are all found out ahmed the new astrologer has told the king that there are forty of us <laughs> there needed no astrologer to tell that said the captain of the gang this ahmed with all his simple good nature is a shrewd fellow forty chests have been stolen he naturally guessed that there must be forty thieves and he has made a good hit that is all still it is prudent to watch him for he certainly has made some strange discoveries one of us must go to-night after dark to the terrace of this cobbler's house and listen to his conversation with his handsome wife for he is said to be very fond of her and will no doubt tell her what success he has had in his endeavours to detect us everybody approved of this scheme and soon after nightfall one of the thieves repaired to the terrace he arrived there just as the cobbler had finished his evening prayers and his wife was giving him the first date ah said ahmed as he took it there is one of the forty the thief hearing these words hastened in consternation to the gang and told them that the moment he took his post he had been perceived by the supernatural knowledge of ahmed who immediately told his wife that one of them was there the spy's tale was not believed by his hardened companions something was imputed to his fears he might have been mistaken in short it was determined to send two men the next night at the same hour they reached the house just as ahmed having finished his prayers had received the second date and heard him exclaim my dear wife to-night there are two of them the astonished thieves fled and told their still incredulous comrades what they had heard three men were consequently sent the third night four the fourth and so on being afraid of venturing during the day they always came as evening closed in and just as ahmed was receiving his date hence they all in turn heard him say that which convinced them he was aware of their presence on the last night they all went and ahmed exclaimed aloud the number is complete to-night the whole forty are here all doubts were now removed it was impossible that ahmed should have discovered them by any natural means how could he ascertain their exact number and night after night without ever once being mistaken he must have learnt it by his skill in astrology even the captain now yielded in spite of his incredulity and declared his opinion that it was hopeless to elude a man thus gifted he therefore advised that they should make a friend of the cobbler by confessing everything to him and bribing him to secrecy by a share of the booty his advice was approved of and an hour before dawn they knocked at ahmed's door the poor man jumped out of bed and supposing the soldiers were come to lead him to execution cried out have patience i know what you are come for it is a very unjust and wicked deed most wonderful man said the captain as the door opened we are fully convinced that thou knowest why we are come nor do we mean to justify the action of which thou speakest here are two thousand pieces of gold which we will give thee provided thou wilt swear to say nothing more about the matter say nothing about it said ahmed do you think it possible i can suffer such gross wrong and injustice without complaining and making it known to all the world have mercy on us exclaimed the thieves falling on their knees only spare our lives and we will restore the royal treasure the cobbler started rubbed his eyes to see if he were asleep or awake and being satisfied that he was awake and that the men before him were really the thieves he assumed a solemn tone and said <clears throat> guilty men ye are persuaded that ye cannot escape from my penetration which reaches unto the sun and moon and knows the position and aspect of every star in the heavens your timely repentance has saved you but ye must immediately restore all that ye have stolen go straight away and carry the forty chests exactly as ye found them and bury them a foot deep under the southern wall of the old ruined himam beyond the king's palace if ye do this punctually your lives are spared but if ye fail in the slightest degree destruction will fall upon you and your families the thieves promised obedience to his commands and departed 
Ahmed then fell on his knees and returned thanks to God for this signal mark of his favor. About two hours after, the royal guards came and desired Ahmed to follow them. He said he would attend them as soon as he had taken leave of his wife, to whom he determined not to impart what had occurred until he saw the result. He bade her farewell very affectionately. She supported herself with great fortitude on this trying occasion, exhorting her husband to be of good cheer, and said a few words about the goodness of providence. But the fact was, Sitara fancied that if God took the worthy cobbler to himself, her beauty might attract some rich lover, who would enable her to go to the hammam with as much splendor as the astrologer's lady, whose image, adorned with jewels and fine clothes, and surrounded by slaves, still haunted her imagination. The decrees of heaven are just. A reward suited to the merits awaited Ahmed and his wife. The good man stood with a cheerful countenance before the king, who was impatient for his arrival, and immediately said, Ahmed, thy looks are promising. Hast thou discovered my treasure? Does your majesty require the thieves or the treasure? The stars will only grant one or the other, said Ahmed, looking at his table of astrological calculations. Your majesty must make your choice. I can deliver up either, but not both. Oh, I should be sorry not to punish the thieves, answered the king, but if it must be so, I choose the treasure. And you give the thieves a full and free pardon? I do, provided I find my treasure untouched. Then, said Ahmed, if your majesty will follow me, the treasure shall be restored to you. The king and all his nobles followed the cobbler to the ruins of the old hammam. There, casting his eyes towards heaven, Ahmed muttered some sounds, which were supposed by the spectators to be magical conjurations, but which were in reality the prayers and thanksgivings of a sincere and pious heart to God for his wonderful deliverance. When his prayer was finished, he pointed to the southern wall and requested that his majesty would order his attendants to dig there. The work was hardly begun when the whole forty chests were found in the same state as when stolen, with the treasurer's seal upon them still unbroken. The king's joy knew no bounds. He embraced Ahmed and immediately appointed him his chief astrologer, assigned to him an apartment in the palace, and declared that he should marry his only daughter, as it was his duty to promote the man whom God had so singularly favored, and had made instrumental in restoring the treasure of his kingdom. The young princess, who was more beautiful than the moon, was not dissatisfied with her father's choice, for her mind was stored with religion and virtue, and she had learnt to value beyond all earthly qualities that piety and learning which she believed Ahmed to possess. The royal will was carried into execution as soon as formed. The wheel of fortune had taken a complete turn. The morning had found Ahmed in a wretched hovel, rising from a sorry bed, in the expectation of losing his life. In the evening he was the lord of a rich palace, and married to the only daughter of a powerful king. But this change did not alter his character. As he had been meek and humble in adversity, he was modest and gentle in prosperity. Conscious of his own ignorance, he continued to ascribe his good fortune solely to the favor of providence. He became daily more attached to the beautiful and virtuous princess whom he had married, and he could not help contrasting her character with that of his former wife, whom he had ceased to love, and of whose unreasonable and unfeeling vanity he was now fully sensible. This ends the tale of the Cobbler Astrologer, as told by Charles John Tibbets.